Hi everyone, welcome back to the Pleasuring Shed. Uh, we're back here for another episode of the Making of Black Bond Floats. Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, Sarkanda Reed. Yeah, I'll tell you what that is all about in a minute. But first of all, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you from me and from Ali, who is my brilliant editor and camera operator. Um, just to say thank you for all your subscriptions, all your kind comments. Um, and all the views that we've had, I just, I'm absolutely blown away by how many views we've had um, on the late, last video. So thank you very much for that. That's really, really kind. So let's talk about Sarkander Reed. Um, we're going to make a float. Uh, here is the float we're going to make. It's a straight waggler. It's a bit like the bamboo waggler that we made in the first episode. Um, but this isn't bamboo. This is a Sarkander Reed. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about what Sarkanda reed is, where you can find it, and the different thicknesses and types, and then we'll talk about the different types of floats we can make from it as well, because it's a really versatile material. So Sarkanda reed, what is it? Well, it's a reed, uh, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. Up until two years ago, when I first started making floats, I'd never even heard of Sarkanda reed. I didn't know what it was. Never even came into my orbit. So it wasn't until I started re reading up on doing uh, making floats and watching other YouTube videos. There's some great, great videos out there of float makers. Um, I didn't know what it was. I heard about it, started reading up on it, started watching the videos, as I said, and discovered that I could buy some online and bought some. And wow, what a game changer. This stuff is brilliant. Um, I'd used Norfolk Reed in the past. Um, and I'd used the, the balsa wood as well, but Sarkanda Reed, yeah, it's the future. It's a brilliant, brilliant product. So let's take a little bit of a look at the product itself. So when I buy my Sarkanda Reed, I get it online. There's various uh, online sellers that do it on eBay as well. And I buy it in a variety of different sizes just to give me different options for the floats that I'm gonna make. With the thickness of the reed, and the consistency of the reed, it really helps that the reed is quite predictable with its shotting weight with the type of float that you make. So with things like bamboo, with porcupine quill, with goose quill, it can be a little bit unpredictable. You can get a really thick, heavy bamboo, which takes hardly any shot at all. But you can get quite a light porcupine quill, which takes four BB. There really isn't a lot of, of accuracy when you're picking your, your float that you want to make. But with the Sarkanda reed, it's much more predictable and therefore makes float making much more easy. If a customer asks me, can you make me four floats, two at 3BB and two at 4BB, I can pretty much pick the thickness of the stem, cut them to the length, and I can be fairly accurate within a few, few, few degrees of what the weight is going to be. Uh, obviously that comes with a little bit of practice, um, but yeah, let's take a little bit of look at some of the reed that I've got on my bench here. So from here, we've got, we start off with a really thick uh, reed. It's about seven to eight millimeters, really good for straight wagglers. Um, if you want to get a good float for casting a long way, you know, cutting it at about 10 to 12 centimeters, you're looking at three, four triple A, really good heavy float. You can also cut it short and use it as a body of the float rather than making a waggler. You can make uh, Avon bodied style or stick float, that sort of thing. Uh, and then it graduates down through right down to sort of three millimeter reed there. I don't use this a lot, but I know people use it as, as a stem um, for, for a tip of the float. So if they were making an insert waggler, um, personally, I think it's a little bit weak and it can break quite easily. So I prefer to use the bamboo cane, the skewer for that. Um, but yeah. I tend to make my floats sort of somewhere in the middle, around the, the four to five millimeter, six millimeter range, and I can be fairly accurate and fairly predictable in the shotting weight of the float that I'm trying to make. So the reed itself, I believe, comes from India, um, and it comes in pre-cut lengths when you buy it from your provider. Um, it's got a, a hard outer casing, and inside, it's like a well, it's like a pulp inside, like a fibrous pulp, some kind of the consistency of polystyrene a bit. 
Um, it makes it really easy when you're inserting a skewer into there to make the foot. So if we look at this straight waggler that we've got here, when you're making the foot of the waggler, which we tie the eye onto, I literally push that skewer inside the float. And we'll show you how to do that a little bit later because we're going to be making one of these floats. And yeah, when you put a bit of glue in there and it sticks to it like what's it to a blanket. So it's really, really good. Um, yeah, that's it really. That's about the, the, the all you need to know about the Sarkanderid. When you buy it, there are two options you can buy. You can buy uh, pre-sanded. So I don't know if you can pick this up on the camera. This is a pre-sanded piece and it's got a real matte finish to it. Okay, but it, and you can see, I don't know if you can see the dust that's come off it on my finger there from where it's been sanded. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, or you can buy it unsanded. So this one is a little bit shinier. I don't know if you can see the difference between the two there. So it's a little bit shiny. It's got like a, like a waxy coating on the outside. Either or doesn't matter. The pre-sanded I prefer personally because it saves me having to sand them all down because that's what we will have to do if we're using an unsanded one. Um, but it really is your choice. They don't have to be sanded down. Um, but when you are putting your varnish on, putting your paint on, having them just nibbed off makes all that stick to it, keys to it a little bit better. So that's about the only options you really need to think about. The, the thickness of the stem, whether it's sanded or, or not sanded, and the lengths come in usually around 30 centimetre lengths. Um, it's very rare that I'm going to make a float that's 30 centimetres long, so I probably get two, maybe three, sometimes even four floats out of one stem, depending on the type of float that I make. But for today, as we've said, we're going to make uh, just a straight waggler, just to show you how really easy it is to work with this Sarkander reed. Really simple float. Um, and yeah, let's crack on and take the first steps to making it. So I've chosen the stem of Sarkander reed that I'm going to use. Uh, it's about five, six mil in diameter. Uh, this is an unsanded bit of stem. So the first job I'm going to have to do is just nib off this waxy surface just to make it nice and dull and that will help the, the varnish and the paint key into it when we go. So a bit of old, uh, quite fine sandpaper, you don't want it too rough. The outer skin on the sarcanderide is quite thin, so really don't be too too fine with it because you and to use a too coarse of paper because you'll just rub straight through it into the fibrous mesh uh, pulp underneath and then it's kind of a bit, it's a bit ruined. So this is an old bit of sandpaper, it's 220 grit, which is quite fine, um, but it's also been used quite a lot, so it's, it's a bit worn. So yeah, let's just nib it off now. So it's nice and light. And all the way up and down. Again, like I said, don't press too firmly. It's just a very, very light sanding. And then once you've done that end, turn it over. And as I'm rubbing up and down, I'm also slowly rotating as well. You probably can't pick that up on the camera, but I am slowly rotating the, the stem as well. There we are. That's all there is to it. And that just takes off that shiny surface. So now the cane is ready. What I want to do now is decide how long I want my float and to cut the stem in the length that I want. So I'm going to make the stem around 11 centimeters. I think uh, from personal choice, um, it, it really doesn't matter. You can make your floats as long as you want. I'm going to go with 11 centimeters just because I know that will give me about three to four shotting weight, three, three to four BB shotting weight once it's finished. So marking it at 11 centimeters, I'm going to get two stems, uh, two floats out of this one stem. So if I marked it at 11, I'll then mark it at 22 as well. So both stems are 11 centimeters each. And then I'm going to cut it. Now I'm going to cut it using uh, just a, a razor saw. Uh, it's a nice fine blade. Uh, so it doesn't tear into the outer skin of the reed too much. So I'm also going to cut it on a mitre block. So I'm going to use my marks there. I'm going to put it in the mitre block and I'm going to get it cut. So let's just move over to the mitre block. So I'm placing my um, piece of reed, the stem, into a mitre block. What this does is it just allows me to cut through the stem nice and straight. Then using the razor saw and placing it in the slot uh, 
on the little mark that I've made with the pencil. And I don't want to be too rough with this now. So it's a, you know, letting the saw do the work. So just a small amount of pressure and just cutting in. If you go too fast, it will rip the outside edge. I also like to slowly rotate the stem as well and just cutting through it nice and fine. So we get a nice even cut, and particularly well. There we are. Don't throw away the end. That's the bit, that's the bit that we're not going to use. Don't throw it away. I've got a little pot where I keep all my offcuts because they'll always come in handy for something. So the next bit is to cut that again in half, and that will be my two 11 centimeter floats then. One little cut, give it a slight rotation, one more little cut. You notice I'm only cutting in one direction. I'm not dragging the saw backwards and forwards. And the reason for that is what we don't want to tear and make all the ends all jagged. And by sawing backwards and forwards, you will get lots of jaggedy bits on the end. So just one smooth straight cut through it, then rotate the reed and then cut through it again. And you get a nice clean cut. So there we are, two bits of reed, not the same length. Someone needs to check their measuring. So here are two stems at 11 centimeters. There is an old saying, isn't there? Measure twice, cut once. There we are. Let's move on. We're not perfect. Right, so we've got our two stems, both of them 11 centimeters. Next job to do now is to uh, choose a bamboo skewer, which we're gonna make the foot end of the float, which is what we're gonna whip the eye onto. So let's choose a piece of bamboo skewer. Got some up here. So we're looking for a nice clean piece with no um, no sort of knots in it or anything like that. And we want the pointy end. That's what we're looking for is the pointy end. So take your stem with the pointy end of the skewer. We are going to find the center, roughly in the center. And we're literally going to just push it in. Now here, you need to be a little bit careful. What we don't want to do is just ram it in there because if we do that it's all going to split open and it's a waste of stem so we need to be pushing the skewer into the stem very gently and twisting and um, what i'm doing is i'm twisting the stem and the skewer in kind of opposite directions so very slowly a slight bit of pressure i'm just twisting them as i go trying to keep it nice and straight and i'm just going to push that in probably a about an inch, maybe not quite that far, two centimeters, like that. And then I'm going to take it out. So that's how far I've gone in. What's that? About two centimeters there. And then you can see it's left a nice hole down the center of the stem, roughly in the center. Doesn't matter if it's not perfectly in the center, but it's roughly in the center. So the next thing to do now is to get uh, the shape of this end of the stem. We're just gonna chamfer that off a bit like we did with the bamboo waggler. We shake that down so that it, it makes it easier for when we're whipping the thread on. Now for this, uh, I'm gonna use my electric sander because it just gives a nicer finish. But you can do it with a sanding block um, and you're just gonna take off a little bit of that edge. Be very, very gentle with it. It doesn't take a lot of sanding at all, uh, but that's what we're gonna do next. So we've used the sander, we've got that stem just tapered off at the end there. Uh, I really like that little sander. It's a bit noisy, but it's absolutely perfect for, for the float making that I do. Um, again, it's, a, it's an Amazon special, but it's absolutely perfect. So we've got that tapered off. The next thing to do is get our bamboo skewer glued in to the hole that we've already pre-made. Now, the reason I pre-make the hole when we've got lots of pulp around the outside and the stems all the way down, the hole goes in nice and neat. If I try and make the hole now after tapering it off, 
all of this sort of soft pulp on the outside here that all starts to split um, and it just makes it a bit of a messy finish. Again, it's trial and error. These are the things that I've learned over making many, many different flights. So I pre-make the hole and then I sand it down. So we need a little bit of super glue. I've got my super glue here. Again, I love using this type of super glue because it just sets really quickly. So I just want a tiny little blob right on the end there, right in the hole. It's a bit stringy, it's a bit cold, that's why. And then we take our skewer and we insert, push it down. Again, don't go ramming it in because you'll split the, the stem and it will be a waste of all your efforts so far. So there we are, that's glued in there now, and this stuff almost dries instantly. There's absolutely no movement in that. I don't know what it is, but as soon as this bamboo stem comes in contact with this pulpy material, it just grips it almost instantly. It's fantastic. So now we've got that, what we're gonna do is measure the length of that, our little foot and get that marked and cut. So we'll find our ruler. I'm going to make the little foot end about two and a half centimeters. That gives me enough, if you look at the one we've pre-made, to whip the eye on, get a little bit of decorative whipping on there, and then whip up onto the body. So two and a half centimeters is a good length. Again, it's your choice. You can make it longer or shorter. You don't have to do everything that I do the way I do it. So what we've got. Here we are, two and a half centimetres. I've got that marked. And I'm just going to cut it with a pair of side cutters. Just like we did when we were making the bamboo waggler. Here we are. Keep that, don't throw that away. That'll come in handy for the next float that we make. So there's the basic shell of the float. We've got our body, we've got our foot end. What we need to do now is taper off the bottom end of the foot there, ready to whip on our eyelet. Now the stem is on, the foot is on there. Uh, I'm going to just chamfer off the end of that, make a little bevel on the end, and then I'm going to flatten it on either side. And I'm going to do that again on my little electric sander, just because it's much quicker and much easier. So let's go over to that. So you can see what we've done on the end there. I hope you can see, let's get it on a dark surface. We've made that more into a, into a flat end either side, and that's gonna make the eye easier to whip on. So my next job is to put a split in the end of the bamboo skewer there, and that's gonna take the thread when we start the whipping. So very carefully using your, your sharp knife, find the center and just press into it and it splits really easily. All it is, half a centimeter split, just down the center. And then when we take our thread, and we use a, a black thread as usual for me. And we're going to place that into the split that I have just made. There we are. Got that little tag end there. I'm just gonna snip a little bit off of that because that's a little bit long. And then I am going to use the lighter and I'm going to burn down and squash it against the bamboo skewer there. Squash it down with my finger. It goes nice and flat and the thread is now really nice and firmly tight into that little grab and it's going to make it nice and easy for when I start my whip. So the next thing I need is my eyelet, so safety pin, and I'm going to cut the head off that safety pin. So I need my side cutters for that. And just placing it in the side cutters, finger over the end so it doesn't shoot off somebody in the eye. And as before, you've seen this on other videos, there's our eyelet, really simple. It doesn't get any easier than that. Right, now we're going to attach the eye 
to the bamboo uh, skewer I'm squeezing it onto the end and I'm going to hold it with my other fingers all a bit fiddly so remember when we're whipping again this is my way of doing things you've all got your own styles I'm sure you'll develop your own styles I'm going to start by going underneath and round and over the top so that's what we start going to do and we're just whipping around a few times once we've got three or four whips on there we can then let go of the safety pin eyelet thing it will hold itself in place now I'm whipping up towards the eyelet at the moment and then once I've whipped up towards the eye I'll change the angle and I'm going to whip back down over the top of what I've just done just to begin with it gives it a nice double layer of whipping that you can see that I'm not quite sure what the best angle is we'll keep going all the way up to the eyelet we'll change the angle and we're going to come back down again the other side I'm going over the top of what I've already whipped. That's fine. It gives it a bit of double strength. Holds that uh, either in place really nice and strong. And the thread I'm using is a nylon based thread. You can use cotton threads. Cotton threads tend to be a little bit weaker. So the more pressure you put on it as you keep that thread taut, there is a risk that it will snap. So um, I do tend to prefer the nylon based threads. There might be a specific colour that you want to use and you can only find it in a cotton thread. It's not an issue. Uh, to say, just don't pull so hard on a cotton thread because they do tend to snap a little bit easier. So we keep rotating. And I think I mentioned this before in one of my videos that I don't use any kind of machines or uh, turning things for, for doing my whipping. All of my whipping is done by hand. So on every float that's for sale on, on my eBay site, um, they're, they're all made in exactly the same way. So I've just changed the angle slightly now of the whip and I'm starting to whip up the, the length of the stem, the skewer, and you're getting that nice spiral pattern. Um, and then I'm going to straighten up again. Now this is where you need to change things a little bit. The pulp section here that's exposed is quite soft. So if you put lots of tension on the thread as you start to whip up that area, it will squash the pulp and it will look really wonky and horrible and lumpy. So we're going to have to let off the tension a little bit, not too much, but just a little bit so that it doesn't cut into that pulp area. The good thing about the pulp area is it's actually it's quite grippy. So as the thread goes up the pulp, it sticks to it quite nicely. Just keep spinning it round and working your way up the slope until you're onto the main stem again, onto the hard outer coating. Even then, when you're on that hard overcoat, outer coating you don't really want to pull too hard on the thread because it will cut into the stem uh, and cause it to crack so once we're up onto the main body we've now got to think about tying it off so we're going to use our ever faithful little bit of fishing line loop that we made in our first video about the bamboo skewer so if you remember that um, you can see that there we've got that little loop so we're going to place the little loop under the thread, clamp it down under my thumb and squash it underneath my forefinger as well. Don't take the pressure off this finger. Okay. If you take the pressure off the finger here, all of your threads will undo and you'll have to start the whole thing again. It's very annoying. So with the line clamped underneath, we're going to do four more turns. Three or four is fine. I'm going to go with four two, three, four. And make sure that's all nice and snug. I'm going to cut this bit off now using our scissors. 
to that off. And then we're going to pass the tag end through the loop. And then this bottom end of the loop, we're going to pull back underneath the main thread that we've whipped over the top and it goes underneath and we pull it all the way through. You loop away somewhere safe so you don't lose it. Just check that it's all nice and neat. And then we're going to snip off this tag end using our super sharp knife. And a scalpel blade or a razor blade is ideal for this. Just letting the blade slice through it, don't force it. Let the blade do the work. And there we are. So there's your eyelet whipped on, a little bit of decorative whipping, and we're starting to move up onto the main stem. I'm going with the yellow whipping, a uh, yellow thread rather for my decorative whipping. Uh, so I'm going to place that on there. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the whipping here, but if you're new to the videos and you want to know what's going on and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, have a look back at the uh, bamboo waggler, at the porcupine quill, at the goose quill, and I go into a lot more detail about the whipping there. I'm just getting this done nice and quickly. Snipping off the tag end. Yeah, I've got a nice yellow band. And now we're going to put some bit of a spiral in it. And finish with a band at the top. Put that down. A loop. A loop underneath. And we're going to do three more turns. Two, three. Just so that the band at the top and the band at the bottom are of a similar thickness. Just so it's symmetrical. Through the eye. And pull it through. Make sure it's nice and neat, all nice and square and straight. And then we slice through tag end, finish it off. Done. I'm also going to add another thin black band at the top, just so that it, it uh, sort of encapsulates the yellow. It's just decorative, it's purely my choice. You can be as creative as you want. So I'll get that done now. With the whipping done, I'm going to add that little coat of varnish. I'm going to use, uh, as always, the, the Rustin's Outdoor Clear Varnish, um, just to add a little coat to it, and that will help bond it and seal it, and it will make it easier to handle and stops the threads from unwinding when you're, when you're handling the float. Uh, to make my life a little bit easier, I have poured my Rustin's Outdoor Clear Varnish into one of these uh, jars, I forget the name of them, they're called something special, but I can't remember what it is. But anyway, it makes it a lot easier to get in and out of the jar. So just pop the lid, and there we are. Rather than prizing the lid off the pot and putting it down and getting it all on my hands, this makes it a little bit easier. But it is the same Rustin's varnish. So let's uh, dip the brush and give that a coat of varnish. I do like this varnish uh, purely because it goes on really, really easily. Coats and, cover, coats and covers uh, really easily. And it dries nice and quickly as it is quick drying varnish. Um, so it's handleable in sort of 15, 20 minutes. I wouldn't say it's thoroughly dry, but it's handleable, is a word, uh, in about 15 to 20 minutes. So that's great. Now, that's that done. So what I'll do now is hang that up to dry. So I'll put that up there on my little hanging shelf. As you can see, I've got all floats up here, all in various stages of, of build. You may not have uh, a nice shelf with nails knocked into it that you can hang your floats on. Uh, so here's something I made earlier. I just grab it out. 
Now, I am no carpenter. I am not a woodwork, woodworker. Uh, but here's something I made um, just so that you can see something you can make really easily yourself. It's just, what is it, five pieces of wood knocked together with nails. And what I've done is I've just put some nails in here um, and I've cut off using my side cutters, cut off the head of the nail. So just left with a pin. Um, and there's the float that I've just varnished. You can literally just hang it on there. Hang the float on there to varnish, uh, to, for the varnish to dry. So it's not laying down. Uh, it all runs, this, if there are any runs in it, it runs down nice and smoothly. It's really easy, really simple. Yeah, so that's that. So if you want to make yourself up something like that, I'm not going to tell you how to do it because I am terrible at woodwork, as you can see, but it serves a purpose. So there we are. So I'll put that to dry to one side and I'll come back in about 15 minutes when that's gone off. So the varnish has gone off now, so that's nice. I can handle the float nice and easily without fear of the threads unwinding, coming loose. You can tell when it's gone off because it goes nice and clear. When we paint the varnish on, it goes on like a milky white color. And as it dries, it dries nice and clear. So that's all good. Next job is to uh, mark where we're going to paint the color tip, the bit that sticks out of the water, the bit that you actually see. Uh, I'm gonna mark it at three centimeters and that's gonna give me a little bit of play with the color choices that I have on the tip. So let's mark it at three centimeters. that done find my brush and I'm just going to use a plain matte white this is Revels matte number five matte white and I'm just going to give the white uh, the tip a coat of white paint uh, and the reason I paint on a white base coat is that the fluorescent colors that we use the yellows and the oranges are a little bit opaque and they don't brush on quite so nicely straight onto the stem. If the stem's quite dark, it can actually show through and the, the colors don't pop. So having that white base coat really helps the colors stand out. You can be quite liberal with the white paint, a nice even covering. Again, it will probably require two coats of white. We don't want any dark areas. Again, any dark areas showing through the white Will also show through the high vis colors that we put on. So we'll give it one coat and don't forget, of course, to paint the end. Now, another little thing you can do here if you want to, this is something a bit different. Now, I don't really dip my tips into the paint, but what I am going to do is literally just put the surface, that flat surface there, into my pot of paint and you'll see what will happen. Just dip it in, literally let it touch the surface and then pull it out again. And what that does, it gives me a nice little dome just on the end. Uh, and as that dries, it will shrink slightly. But if I do that with the yellow and the orange that I'll paint over the top, that'll give me a nice dome effect on the top of the float and be nice and hard as well. So let's get that hung up to dry and then we can start looking at the next color. So the white paint has gone off and I've actually given it a second coat of white. So that's all now ready to put our colors on. Something you might want to consider, it's not my choice personally, but you could paint the entire stem of the float before you put your whipping on. Some people like to use black floats or brown floats. So you could paint the whole stem and then whip over the top of that once that's dried off. Personally, I like the reed. I like the reed color. I like its it's different shades and, and it's markings. Um, so that's my choice. But like I say, these are your floats. You can do with them as you please. So the two coats of white on there, like I said, they've gone off now. Uh, and then I now need to add the yellow to that. So that I'm using the Revel here, uh, Revel uh, paints. Uh, it's an enamel paint, it's SM312, which I think is silk matte. And it's a nice high vis yellow. So we'll put that to one side because I've already painted it just to speed things up a little bit. So we've got the yellow on there now. That's all nice and dry as well. Now it's your choice what you do with the colors. You can leave it all yellow if you want and just put a piece of black whipping around the bottom. You can, you know, make bands of color, whichever you choose. It's, it's entirely up to you. Be as creative and as decorative as you want. 
for me personally, I am going to make the top of the float red and leave a yellow band at the base. And then I can whip over the top of the join between the two color paints. So the paint I'm going to use for the tip is another Revel paint. This is SM332, I haven't got my glasses on, SM332. And that is going to give us a float color that looks like that. So there we are. So again, I've put two coats on over the yellow. Uh, so you can see a nice contrast between the two colors. The next thing to do now is add the whipping. Now what the whipping does, again, is purely decorative. And all it does is just neaten up that join. As you can see, my line there is not very straight. If you really wanted to make a nice straight line, put a little bit of masking tape around the tip of the yellow there and then paint up to it. And as you take the masking tape off, you get a nice crisp line. If you want to leave it like that, that's your choice. But I'm going to whip over the top of that join and that's going to hide that messy finish there. So that's what I'm going to do now. Let's get it done. So I'll take my black thread and I'm going to start my whipping. So pinch it under my thumb, just about the join between the two colors. And I'm going to start to whip over the top. And I'm going to have to put my glasses on for this. Page is a wonderful thing. And as we turn, we're going to whip over the top of the thread that you were holding. Make sure that's all nice and square and neat. Don't want it to be too thick. It's just to cover the join. I'm going to snip off this tag end now. So you can see, remember, I've clamped it under my finger. Snip off the tag end. And I'm going to give it a few more turns. And then I'm going to change the angle slightly and whip down in a spiral. Tightness of the spiral is up to you. If you make it too tight, you kind of cover up the yellow completely and then it defeats the object of having the difference in the colors. So I like my spiral to be nice and wide. And then I'm seeing more of the yellow than I am seeing more of the whipping. Again, just making another thick band at the bottom. Get my bit of fishing line with my loop. Tuck it underneath. Clamp it. And carry on turning for another three or four turns. So one, two, three. Remember to keep a reasonable amount of tension on your thread. Don't overdo it because you will cut into the, the uh, sarcandery there. So scissors, snip that off and tacking the tag end in through the loop and pulling the loop back under the whipping. Yeah. Make sure that's all nice and neat. Pull. We'll use our sharp blade and we will slice through our tag end. And there we are. And now that horrible join you can see there has been covered over by the whipping to make it a nice neat finish. So next job is to give that whole float now uh, a coat of the Clear varnish, quick drying, Rustin's varnish, and then that'll be ready then to put some shot on it and get it measured and shotted in our pasta jar. So before I put my final coat of varnish on, I did actually add uh, another yellow band of whipping there, just a decorative band. Just again, it's just my thing. Uh, I think it looks quite nice. So the varnish is on and it's gone dry. So that's the Rustin's clear quick drying varnish now. And I've left that overnight. And the reason I've left that overnight, I really wanted that varnish to go quite hard um, because I'm about to put it in the water and then I'm going to write on top of the varnish as well. If you just let the varnish go touch dry and then try and write on it with the Sharpie, the Sharpie can actually cut through the, the varnish. So really give that a good few hours to go really quite firm and hard and off. So my next job is to put the float in the water and get it shotted the way you want it. 
again, go through this on my, my other videos as well. The shotting weight is entirely up to you what you want to do. Um, for my personal choice, I'm going to shot it up to that black line there. See that? I'm going to shot it up to that line there so that if I get a lift bite, I've got a little bit of more indication there as the yellow is exposed as the float lifts. So let's find a bit of fishing line, which I've got here. I've got three BB already attached. Now I'm guessing this is going to be a little bit heavier than three BB, but we'll find out. So again, it's trial and error. So I'm going to use the three BB. I'm going to take one off the bottom and put it on the top. Squeeze that on the line. So we've got so we've got the float there with three BBs on the line. So let's put it in the water and see what happens. Okay, that's not bad, but it's sitting for me, it's sitting a little bit high. Now for some people, bring that to the edge so they can see it. For some people, that is where they want it. For me, that's a little bit high. So I want to bring that float a little bit further down. So I'm going to try to go on that. I'm going to try actually a fourth BB and let's see what happens. Let's find another BB. I've got one here. I'm going to attach that down the line on the bottom. Squeeze it on. And let's see what happens there. Okay, that's not too bad at all. If anything, for me, it's sitting a little bit low. If I want to put a big fat juicy worm on there, that's going to pull that down even more. So I think if we go take that fourth BB off and put on a number one, I think that will just sit perfectly. And that allows me to add the weight of the bait then as well. So let's take off that bottom BB and let's find a number one shot. There it is. So we've got now three BB and a number one. So let's see how that affects the float and how it sits. Oh, look at that, spot on. So we've got number one at the bottom and then three BB, and that is bringing it absolutely bang on that line. So I'm really happy with that. So we'll get that out of the, float, uh, out of the water, we'll get that dried off, and we'll get it marked up. Take the line off, back to one side, get a bit of tissue. Just dry that off. Make sure that the shaft is nice and dry when you want to write on it, otherwise your sharpies won't work properly. So I've gone for a fine tip sharpie uh, in black. You can use any colour you like. So what did we say it was? It was 3BB and a number one. So I'm going to write that on there. 3BB. Typical. Pen's not working when you want it to. And we have to put up with all this inferior quality stuff. 3BB plus the number one. There we are. So you can see that written on there. 3BB. Show it to that camera. 3BB. And number one. So when I get the float out of my tackle box, it's really easy to work out how much shot I'm going to need. I'm also going to write on here black bottom floats because it's a black bottom float after all. So just some ideas. If you were thinking about making some floats as gifts to give away to parents, brothers, uncles, sisters, aunties, mums, whatever. You can write anything you like on there. Happy birthday, happy Christmas, yeah, whatever. So I put on there my logo, black bottom floats, and I've got my shot anyway. So I'm going to give that another coat of the Rustin varnish now, just to seal that in before I put the yacht varnish in on my final coat. So the rusting varnish has gone off on there. So that was the quick drying varnish just to seal in the, the, the writing that we've done. So that's all gone off now nice and dry. So my next job is to put the yacht varnish on. This will be the final coat. And it's the yacht varnish that really makes the floats waterproof and able to stay in the water for a good long time. So I'm using, again, as another rusting product. Um, it's a 
satin finish yacht varnish. Um, I have got it poured into my other jar with the lid on it purely to make it easier uh, and quicker for when I'm varnishing and painting and all the rest of it. So nice soft brush again and just dip it in and then start varnishing. So again with the yacht varnish don't go too heavy handed. You don't want runs and drips in the varnish as you hang it up to dry. I'm just going to give it a nice even coat spreading it right into the gaps, into the cracks and crevices of the whipping. It's nice and even. Now, working all the way up and down the shaft of the float. I'm going to stop at the yellow and black line here because I need to hold the float with my other fingers and I don't want to get them all covered in varnish. And then when I come to paint the other end, when this has been touched dry, I know that I've kind of varnished up to the, the yellow line there. Doesn't matter if it overlaps a little bit. At least I know where to stop. There we are. So that's a nice even coat all the way over. And then let's hang that up to dry. And find the hole. There we are. So that's up to dry now. I'm going to clean my brush. In a moment, what we're left with then, once the varnish has gone off, is the float ready to use. So this is the final product. Really simple float to make. I hope you enjoyed uh, making it with me. What we're going to do now, get down to the lakeside and see if we can catch a fish with it. Fingers crossed. We had a good session last time. Let's see if we can have a good session this time. See you on the lakeside. Welcome back to the lake. Here we are again. Uh, we're going to test out our new float. You join me on a beautiful November afternoon, more blue skies, slight gentle breeze, but not disturbing the water too much. Again, another perfect afternoon for float fishing. So the Sikanda Reed Waggler, we made that in the shed um, and we shotted it at 3BB and a number one. Um, I've locked that between two uh, float rubbers. You can see that there, two float rubbers, like we did before with the other floats, the reed, uh, the um, porcupine quill and the goose quill. Um, I've bulk shotted three of the BBs up quite up near the float. And then I've followed that down to a single number one near the bottom. And then about, uh, I don't know, eight to 10 inches down to a size 16 hook. And today I'm fishing maggots. So the temperature's dropping. Uh, again, I think the fish would appreciate a little bit more natural bait. So I'm fishing three white maggots there on the hook. And that's my setup. So again, simple as anything. Let's take a little look at the rod and reel that I'm using today. Uh, so my rod uh, is one of my favorites. This is my go-to rod whenever I'm going to a new venue or somewhere I'm not sure of. This is my go-to rod. I absolutely love it. I've had it for years. I have no idea of the make of it. It's got a signature on it and it says it's 12 foot long, um, but that's about all I know. Uh, but it's caught me some pretty good fish on this. I've had sturgeon. I've had some nice big carp on it. So yeah, absolutely love this rod. Nice long cork handle again, um, going down to me uh, reel seat so I can move the reel around as I need it. Uh, the reel, now this is something of a rarity for me. This is a brand new reel. Um, it's not, yeah, I've had it a couple of years, but I bought it brand new. Uh, so it's an NGT profiler. Don't really know much about them. I'm not sponsored, unless you want to sponsor me, uh, but I'm not sponsored by them. Uh, so NGT profiler, I think it's a 5,000 or a 6,000 size reel. So quite a chunky reel, got eight pound line on it. Uh, and that's going all the way down to the hook. Uh, straight through this time, no hook links. Um, so yeah, so that's my setup. Again, really quite simple. Let's get fishing. Lake's behind me. Let's get the float in the water. So there we are, maggots are on. Let's get this float in the water. 
Let's see what's out there. Lovely, just dropping it in under a tree. I'm always looking for cover, looking for places where you think fish might hide out. Oh, and instantly we're, oh. That was almost instant. Oh, not so good, up the tree. Don't want to be up the tree, we want to be under the tree. There we are, that's better. Pull that line through. Right, let's chuck a couple of maggots in over the top. Let's see what happens. Well, straight away we've got a little nibble. One little fish tugging it around. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Nice little perch. That didn't take long, did it? And as expected with perch, it's absolutely swallowed it down. There we are. See him with his fins up. Lovely. Let's get him back. We've already given him a headache. And away. Fantastic. Right, let's see what else is down there. Something a bit bigger would be nice. So it's more lowering the float in rather than casting it. There we are. Let's flip the line through. And settle down. We have another little dozen or so maggots over the top. Oh, straight away we're. Oh, that's not a perch, that's for sure. That didn't take long at all, did it? And what could that be? It's definitely not a perch. I'm going carp here, I think. Yes, little mirror carp, a couple of pounds. There we are. Let's get the net ready. Not putting up much of a fight, probably because the water's so cold. There we are, and we're in the net. Oh well. Wow. Now that's not bad, that didn't take long at all. Beautiful little mirror car. Right, let's get it on the net. On the mat even. Right on the bottom lip. There we go. There we are, look at that. Lovely little mirror carp, all caught with our handmade Salkander reed waggler. Fantastic end for a fantastic day. I'll see you back in the pleasuring shed and we can talk about the different types of Salkander reed floats that we can make. See you again soon. Salkander reed, what a brilliant float making material and it proved its worth out on the lake and some lovely fish uh, all on this little float really sensitive fantastic to fish with really easy to make and really versatile we'll just take a look on the bench here i've got some different styles of floats that we can make with the sarcander reed different tips different sizes of reed so we're going to take a look at that in the next video we're going to take a little bit more of, of a detailed look at the different styles that we can make and yeah hopefully inspire you to make some of your own so join me again in the pleasuring shed please if you've liked what you've watched Click on the like button. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And yeah, we'll see you soon.